Let's continue on. Now we have a short series, which is the washing of the water by the word. Now this should be in conjunction with how to overcome the sin within. See, because for those of us who have the Spirit of God, obviously we're not out here doing overt sins. Where the biggest battle is, is right up here in the mind. And that then becomes what must be converted by having God with his spirit write his laws and his commandments in our minds and inscribe them in our hearts. And so both of these go through all the scriptures, what is necessary for you to overcome, because that's the biggest battle. Now, with this, we also have the CD to go with it, so you get the message and you get the text. Now let's continue on. Let's come to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 23. And here we're going to see who are the first ones that are responsible for sin in the society. Because if more people were taught about the laws of God and commandments of God, and you would be amazed, I'm going to have to bring a message on this pretty quickly, you would be amazed that 40% of evangelicals believe that Jesus sin. Think on that for a minute, okay? Because it all starts with the clergy. Those who say they're ministers of God, okay? This is why you have these things in very strong language in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 23. Let's pick it up here. Okay, verse 10, Jeremiah 23. For the land is full of adulterers. Now, remember, Jeremiah was witnessing for 40 years and prophesying against the Jews in Judea before they went into captivity into Babylon. And sin always precedes the collapse of any person, family, village, city, state, nation, empire. Always precedes it. And the sin gets worse and worse and worse and worse. Okay? The land is full of adulterers. Because of swearing, the land mourns. The pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up. Here in California, they're burned up. And their course is evil, and they wield power unjustly. Sound like the lockdowns we're in right now? Yes, indeed. Sound like the religious leaders? Yes. Verse 11, for both prophet and priest are ungodly. And you will see that if you watch TBN. The other night I was watching uh, Daystar because Dr. Charles Stanley's on Daystar. How many have seen Charles Stanley? Okay. He's one of the best Protestant preachers. Now, Jesus said of those who were casting out demons in his name but not with the disciples, he told them that those who are not against us are on our part. And Charles Stanley does very well until he comes to Sabbath, holy days. Then following him was his son, Andrew. Okay. And I was shocked. It was all new age. Couldn't believe it. 
Charles Stanley always talks about the Bible and Christ and how to obey him. His son didn't even bring up one scripture in five minutes. Now that shows what happens over a period of time because they really don't stick with the Bible, see? And Charles Stanley doesn't realize that his going against the Sabbath and the Holy Days contributed to how his son came out. So we wish him well. Verse 11, both prophet and priest are ungodly, yea, in my house I have found their evil, says the Lord. So their way shall be to them as slippery ways in darkness. They shall be driven on, and they shall fall in their way, for I will bring evil upon them, even the year of their judgment, says the Lord. Now remember what we saw, that God would give mercy if there were enough righteous people. Okay? So let's hope we're going to have some of that here in the near future. I've seen the repulsive things the prophets of Samaria, they prophesied by Baal and caused my people Israel to go astray. Now, what do we read in Matthew 24 and verse 10? Many shall be led into sin. By whom? By the religious leaders. I've also seen the prophets in Jerusalem a horrible thing. They commit adultery. They walk in lies. They also strengthen the hand of evildoers so that none return from his evil. They are all of them like Sodom to me. They actually have homosexual churches where they use the Bible. Parts of it to justify their way. Oh, and there's even a church of marijuana right up in Northern California. Okay? You know what they use for their excuse? You can eat and use the things that have seed in them. Marijuana has seed in it. So we have sacraments. We smoke pot. Now, can you imagine the twisted reasoning that has to come about with it? But he has a little congregation, and they sit around there, and every day they tell themselves they're right while they're puffing on their pot. Okay? Amazing. Like Sodom and Gomorrah, verse 15. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, I will feed them with wormwood and make them drink poisonous water. For from the prophets of Jerusalem, ungodliness has come forth into all the land. And that's what we have today. Same thing, see? Because human beings are the same. God is the same. Satan is the same. Evil is the same. And when evil becomes legalized, like we've explained a little earlier, then it gets even worse. Okay, verse 16, For thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. They make you vain. They speak a vision from their own heart, not out of the mouth of the Lord. They still say to those who despise me, The Lord has said, you shall have peace. That's exactly what they do in the homosexual churches. That's exactly what they do in the marijuana church. I couldn't believe it when I saw it, you know? And they say to everyone who walks after the imagination of his own heart, no evil will come upon you. And that's exactly where we are in this nation. Okay. For who has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see and to hear his word? 
That's us, brethren. So what happens if the church, churches of God don't do what they should be doing? Think about that for a minute. Look at what happens to the churches. Many of, many of us have been to, through different churches here and there and everywhere trying to find out who's preaching the word of God. And sometimes you don't find it. Well, God looks at that. That's in the equation too when we look at what's going on. Verse 18, who has attended to his word and heard it? Behold, the tempest of the Lord has gone forth in fury, a whirling tempest. That amazing? What's a whirling tempest? Tornado, what's another whirling tempest? Hurricane, how many did we have this year? Record number? Okay, think about it. It shall grievously fall upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord shall not return until he has executed and until he has performed the purposes of his heart in the latter days, you shall understand it perfectly. Now, why is that so? Because we have the word of God. And those of us who have all of it and live by it and are in the churches of God, we've got to stand tall. We've got to stand true. We've got to always live by every word of God, as Jesus said. Verse 21, here's what God says to those prophets and those different ministers. I have not sent them, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But notice the next verse. This tells you how powerful the word of God is and how God will back up his word. See? Verse 22, But if they had stood in my counsel and has caused my people to hear my words, then they would have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doing. See? That's why those things that are in the Bible should be preached to people in the world in the letter of the law, Ten Commandments. Think how much better off the whole society would be if the Ten Commandments were taught. Okay? So much better. But they don't do it. So God says, verse 23, Am I a God who is near, says the Lord, and not a God afar off? Yes. God's not way off in, in some distant galaxy way out there. He's right here. You read the Psalms and it says, The eyes of the Lord look upon men. It says there in John the fourth chapter that God is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. So if there are people out there looking for him, they will find him. See? And we have to be part of that mechanism so that they can find him. Verse 24. Can anyone hide himself in secret places so that I do not see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill the heavens and the earth, says the Lord? That's with everything he's created. I've heard what the prophet said, who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall this be heard of the prophets who prophesy lies, who are prophets of the deceit of their own heart? Okay. They scheme to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell each one to his neighbor, as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. Now notice verse 28. Right in the middle of all of this, 
Here's a prophecy of what needs to be with the churches of God. Verse 28. The prophet who has a dream, let him tell the dream. And he who has my word. Now think about what this is saying. We have the word of God. And all of us as elders and ministers are to learn the word of God, to know the word of God, to understand the word of God, to live by the word of God, to preach the word of God, see? And he who has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. That's what God wants. Then he says, what is the chaff to the wheat, says the Lord? Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Therefore, behold, I'm against the prophets who steal my words, each one from his neighbor. Behold, I'm against the prophets who use their tongues and say, he says when I did not say. Okay? And he's against them because they teach deceit. Now, the same thing applies to the civil leaders. Okay? Same things apply. If they do not serve the people but serve themselves, it's exactly the same thing that's going to fall upon them. See? Okay. And we see that as well. Let's come here and look at some things in the book of Psalms. Let's come to Psalm 50. I don't know how I could do it, and I won't even try. But is it true that when students grow through law school, they take a practice case, and they're the prosecutor one time against the same defendant, and then they're the, defend, uh, the uh, guilty one, or the accused one, rather. So they prosecute against the accused, and then they have to flip around and be the defense for the accused. And that makes the thinking in the mind very disjointed, because you have nothing real solid and firm that you hold on to, see? And that makes truth relevant. When that happens, everybody's in trouble, okay? Psalm 50, let's pick it up here in verse 16. But to the wicked, God says, what right do you have to declare my statutes and to take up my covenant in your mouth. And that's why things go so bad. Yea, you hate to be taught, and you cast my words behind you. Don't they do that with the Sabbath, with the holy days? And who comes and fills in? Satan with Sunday and the holidays. When you saw a thief, then you were pleased to be with him. Sound like a politician? <laughs> He'll give you money for your campaign. And you have taken part with adulterers. You give your mouth to evil. Now think about that for a minute. Apply that to the fake news. Apply that to the politicians. Look at what you have. That's why things are in such a mess. And if Trump gets in, he better call the Secessionist Act real quickly because there's going to be a lot of burning and looting and all of this sort of thing. Okay? That's how evil it has become. You gave your mouth to evil and your tongue to deceit. You sit, you speak against your brother, you slander your own mother's son. Those things you have done, and I have kept silent. Why? Because God wants to know. 
You think you'll come to yourself? You think you'll, that a person will come to a point and say, I've had enough. Well, that happens occasionally. Those who overcome drugs, that's what they have to do. Those who overcome adultery and thievery and any other crime, they have to come to that point. Yes, that day will stop it. He kept silent. You thought that I was like yourself, but I will rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes. Now consider this, you who forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver you. Whoever offers praise glorifies me, and he who sets his conduct aright, I will show him the salvation of God. Now notice, go through all of that. Why do these condemnations come around? To give people a chance to think about what they're doing. And God gives them a chance to recover from it. See? And that's what's so good about the whole situation there. All right? Come to Psalm 55. Psalm 55. Okay? Verse 1. Give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not yourself from my supplication. Attend to me. Answer me. I am distraught in my trouble and moan in my complaint. So here, this person is a very bad situation. Okay? Now we all come to difficulties in our lives that the only thing we can do is turn to God. Other people, they might want to help, but they really can't help you because you've got issues that's between you and God. All of us do. And why do we have those things? To see if we're going to turn to God or not. Okay. So let's see what happens here in the general society. Because the voice of the enemy, because the oppression of the wicked, for they cast mischief upon me, and in anger they hate me. Now this is also a prophecy of Christ. Think of what he went through. No one could have stood up against all the things that Christ did and had thrown at him, except him. See? So, if you think you've had it bad, stop and think what Christ went through. And he's there to help you. He's there to comfort you. He's there to guide you. And he's there to lead you. See? And even if there's trouble all around us, which it is many times, that's the way we survive. Verse 16. As for me, I will call upon God and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon, I will cry aloud in my distress, and he shall hear my voice. He has redeemed my soul in peace from the battle that was against me, for there were many against me. Okay, so this is, you know, this is what we're looking at. Because what's going to happen, it'll happen sooner or later, hopefully later, when, if you say anything from the Bible, you're hateful. It's happened before, happen again, okay? So we have to stay close to God. He has redeemed my soul in peace from the battle that was against me, for there were many against me. God shall hear and afflict them, even he who is enthroned of old, Selah. Those who never change their ways have no fear of God. Now think about that in relationship to what's happening in the world. Okay? Think about what happens for those who go through trials who then get angry against God. 
that doesn't work well. Okay? He has put forth his hands against those who were at peace with him. He has broken his covenant. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were smoother than oil, yet they were drawn swords. Cast your burden upon the Lord. Now that's what needs to be done with us in these times. And I hope that a lot of people out there in the world will stand up for the truth and stand against the evil that is coming and to turn the election around. He will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to, to be moved. But you, O oh God, will bring them down into the pit of destruction, bloody and deceitful men who shall not live but half their days, but I trust in you. Okay? Now let's go back to Psalm 52. Psalm 52. Now you see, this is how we have to confront the problems that come against us with all of this. You watch the news, and there's no way you can come away from that without being upset with some of the people, especially those who know better. See? But you can't get all locked into it. So whatever the difficulty, whatever the problem, you have to take it to God. Okay? Psalm 52, verse 1. Why do you boast yourself an evil, O mighty man? The mercy of God endures forever. Your tongue devises destruction like a sharp razor working deceitfully. You love evil more than good and lying more than speaking righteousness. Okay? That's what we see. All these political people. All these religious people. But we can count on God to come against all of that and to make it right and to bring it about the way that it should be. Okay. Now, let's come to the book of Jude. Now, the book of Jude is very interesting. The book of Jude was written when there was the upheaval in Jerusalem beginning in 66 AD when the Pharisees took over the temple. They were fighting against the, the Romans and starting of the revolution there in 66 AD. And there were a lot of Christians there in Jerusalem that were being deceived into going and fighting. And because there was a lot of deceit going on, even in the church, changing things. So here, the whole book of Jude is a recap of major evil events and how God dealt with them. Okay? So let's pick it up here in verse 3. Now Jude was the half-brother of the Lord. Beloved, when personally exerting all my diligence to write to you concerning the common salvation, I was compelled to write to you exhorting you to fervently fight for the faith that was once for all time delivered to the saints. Okay? Now think about that. We have to fight for the truth. Almost every day I get some something that comes along over the email, something against the word of God. Okay? And we have to know the word of God. See? For certain men have stealthily crept in, those who long ago were written about condemning them to this judgment. They are ungodly men who are perverting the grace of our God and turning it into licentiousness, who are personally denying the only Lord God 
and our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we see happening in Protestantism. That's what we see happening in some of the churches of God in a low degree right now, but may get in a higher degree later on. See? Each one of us individually have to be personally responsible for the word of God. But I myself want to remind you, though you have once understood this, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, the second time destroyed those who did not believe. Major event. What happened? They talked against God. They talked against Moses. They talked against each other. They didn't believe God when he said, go into the land. Think about this for a minute. It's evident when you look at the chronology that God intended the children of Israel to go into the land uh, that he promised to give them, the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Parasites, and so forth, right at the time just before the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay, So they sent in 12 scouts. Ten came back moaning and groaning and complaining, and two, Caleb and, and Joshua, gave a good report. And God said, all right, you're not going in. For every day of the 40 days that they weren't searching out the land, you're going to wander to complete 40 years. God didn't intend them to be 40 years out there. Okay? So, then they said, oh, we'll go. But God said, no, you're not going to go. They were turned back. Now then, the next, next major event he touches is this. And the angels who did not keep their original domain, but deserted their habitation, he is holding in eternal chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. Major event. See? The next one, Sodom and Gomorrah. We've already covered that. Okay, verse 8. In the same way also, these dreamers of filthy dreams are defiling the flesh and declaring as invalid the lordship of God and are blaspheming the divine powers. And that's what they end up doing. See? Look at what they did when Christ was on the earth. Look at what we read in John the 8th chapter. Okay. But Michael the archangel, when he was personally taking issue with the devil disputing about the body of Moses, did not presume to pronounce a railing judgment against him, but said, the Lord himself rebuke you. Okay. Now, these become very serious times when you understand what happened to Jerusalem in 66 to 70 A.D., those were terrible days indeed. Famine, starvation, cannibalism of people and infants. And the Romans deceived them because Jerusalem had enough, enough grain and enough food to feed the city and everything for about five or six years at that time. But they had over two million people come to the feast. And then the Romans encircled them. And then they ran out of food. Nothing to eat. And it was a terrible, terrible time. So then we find, as he's explaining about these things, what's going to happen because there are demonic powers behind it. Verse 11. Woe to them, for they have walked in the way of Cain, and for gain, they have wholly given themselves up to Balaam's delusion and have perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are subversive stains in your love feast, was affecting the church directly. Feasting in person together with you fearlessly, they are feeding themselves. They are clouds without water, driven by the winds, trees of late autumn, 
without any fruit, uprooted and twice dead. Okay, showing they're going into the lake of fire. The Lord's coming, verse 15, to execute judgment against all and to convict all who are ungodly of their works of evil ungodliness that they have impiously committed and of all the hard things the ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are complainers and critics who are walking after their own personal lust. While their mouths are speaking great swelling words, flattering persons for the sake of advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words that were spoken by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have them right here. Because they said to you that in the last times there would be mockers who would be selfishly walking according to their own ungodly lust. These are the ones who cause division. They are psychic, not having the Spirit of God. But you, beloved, be building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, and keep yourselves in the love of God. Now that's what we are to do when these times come upon us. While you are personally awaiting the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Then it says how to deal with some who are doubting, help them along, help them with the word of God. So as we look out and see all of this big political and spiritual battle going on right now, we can keep praying to God that it'll all work out the way that he wants it to and that we're not going to get caught up in these things and let them take us away from God. So I guess you can say that's where the balance hangs today.